thanks for the introduction, um, and thanks for inviting me to this talk today. Um, microphone. I was going to start. You can't hear you. Okay, I'm going to try to speak into the microphone, uh, or maybe take the. Um, so to illustrate it a little bit further, 
uh, this is a video that uh, Stefan Suratu used to make a point about how videos can tell us about Swedish, something about Swedish structure and allow us to take the um, object in the world, just an object as itself, answer the question whether there is an object there or not, uh, in a way that a single image could never uh, do. Right? So if I freeze this video, it would be very hard for an object recognition system, even for humans, to say that there's not an, ob not an object actually in front of us. Uh, but the relationships across frames uh, detect that. Much more simple kind of example is this stereograms. Right? So there's nothing in any of these things that could possibly interest you. But if you squint your eyes a little bit and put these images over each other, you can see that there's this weird structure imaging, which is in this case just a little bar that sticks out there. It's the same thing to the screen. Um, <clears throat> but it's another example of where we don't care about stuff inside the image, we just care about the images. So given that relations are so common, um, can we learn representation of relations? We make relations first class objects that we can then pass on to some module to the reasoning, to the first thing structure or you know, other things. The naive thing that we could try first, that unfortunately doesn't work, is we just concatenate our two images together, X and Y, and feed that to an or an or whatever your favorite feature of the is. Um, they would look something like this. The problem with this is, if you think of it as an RVM, uh, then um, it's well known that given Z, the given variable, it's going to render all these units here conditionally independent. So that would mean if I told you the transformation Z that you're trying to encode here, then uh, there would be nothing I need to tell you about X for you to be able to define Y. Right? So in a graphical model like this, these units will decouple these parts here. And uh, it's just a repercussion of uh, the conditional image independence properties of this kind of graphical model. But the same thing would happen in an autoencoder, for example. If I told you Z, you would know everything about Y. There's no need to refer back to X. And that's exactly not what we want if we want to encode relations. If we want to encode relations, then we want to express our knowledge about Y as a function of the other image X. And so one way to fix this is to say, Let's take a graphical model where we put the pixels from one image and the pixels from the other image and the units that we want to represent the relation to a single tree the graphical model. Um, in that case, those conditional independencies, if we define this clique in the right way, don't exist, and then Z is not going to be able to encode everything about Y. All it can encode is everything about Y as a function of X. And so if X changes, then Y has to change. That's one way to kind of motivate uh, why the ones would want a different type of neuron kind of in our feature learning models if we care about encoding relations. And that neuron has to be able to essentially do multiplication here rather than addition. Because addition would, if you exponentiate it, get back the graphical model, look at independent properties, get back those problems that you don't want. So the easiest thing to fix that is just multiply. Have a clique where these values here are multiplied together and now this independence. Um, I believe the reason why this has never really caught up, um, there have never been a whole lot of people working on this, is that this really requires to replace your neuron that we are so used to, W transpose X, to weight in summation, by something slightly less conventional, which is a product. So a neuron now has to multiply two values together. And uh, put another way, a neuron has to look at the product of to incoming neurons rather than just the way it's sung. Uh, there are biologists who claim this is important, and so if you look at the different trees across many different animals and many different parts of the brain, they look very, very varied and interesting and so on. And so it's not too hard to imagine that what's going on there, and even functionally importantly going on there, it's not just W transpose X, but something more interesting, right? And um, if you want to be good scientists, you still want to have a very, very extreme abstraction, maybe not go into all those details that might be going on, but then we might ask the question, what is the simplest possible change we can do to our standard and 
powerful and confidence, for example, a neural model that would use W transpose X to make it maybe more powerful. And so what I would suggest is let's just detect multiplicative interactions in there and then see how far we can go with them. So that was one way to motivate it. I'm going to show you another way to motivate it uh, before I go through some models. Um, so the task again is you're given two images x and y, and I ask you to give me a hidden representation that involves the relation. Now, if you assume um, that y is a function of x, so some transformed version of x, then uh, if you apply the transformation again and again, you're going to sort of trace out the orbit of your transformation group, as we saw yesterday. And so y, given x, y is going to be distributed along some manifold, some orbit, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that you get by just applying the transformation of it over again. But if I switch x and I do an infinitesimal and change to it, you're going to see another manifold, which is probably, if the change is really infinitesimal, going to be very close to that manifold we saw before. Uh, if I do another change to x, you're going to see another manifold. So the data distribution that we're dealing with here is basically a family of orbits. And that immediately suggests an, an idea of how we might possibly encode the relationship between x and y. What it suggests is, well, let's just take uh, autoencoder or RBM and let it model y, but let's turn the parameters of that model into a function of the other image x. Let's do that in practice. Take an RBM on the second image y. And all we say is the way wij or jk yeah, is going to be a function of the uh, image. The simplest thing you can do is say, let's make that function linear. right? So let's just say wjk becomes now wjk of x. Let's say it's just a linear function of the pixel that we did before. Um, so what happens then is we do inference. We z given x and y. Well, the standard inference equation in the order and order before you apply sigmoid. In your RBM is just a weighted summation of here. Now let's plug in our new definition WJK of X for all weights, and then what you see is that you get a binary response. So the way that you activate hidden units at K is by looking at the linear combination of all the pairwise products of the same thing, The same thing happens if you don't prefer Y with Z and X. <coughs> so there are our products again. So there were a lot of people who looked at this over the last couple of years and tried to learn bilinear models like this. It turns out to be really hard. It turns out not to be really any harder than just training an order encoder or RBM by itself. Because you can define a conditional cost function that always sees an XY pair and it tries to minimize the construction error of the second thing function or the first thing. Um, you can also turn this around, right, of course. Um, and then the mass goes through kind of as usual and nothing really changes on top of each other. The old self is very So here's a, you know, another variation of this okay, the Boltzmann machine, where you define your energy function based on those little products, and you see that the inference comes in to exactly what I said before to buy the energy. And you can use the plus conversion. You can also take an auto encoder and run it to conditional auto encoder that it relations in the same way. The only subtlety then is that you're going to have to turn your encoder and your decoder rates into functions of the other image. And once you do that, you get quotes here. I'm going to encode the relationship rather than this stuff. The nice thing about the other encoder is you can still just as bad You do not even notice that there's something like a function here as compared to a standard auto encoder. Okay, so if you want to have multiplicative interactions between every pair of pixels, it can easily blow up, it can get expensive, computationally, uh, because there might be a lot of pixels in your image patch, for example. And so a very simple trick to deal with that is to say, well, let's not consider every pair of possible products between the units in X and Y. Let's just look at a few of them. And um, if you don't want to rule out any potential transformations that take a pixel from here to here, maybe, 
then uh, that doesn't seem like a good idea, of course. We have to choose which products are you going to keep. But there's a simple solution to that. Let's just pre multiply our inputs onto some new basis, and then have a very restricted multiplicative connectivity in that basis. And then just train that model with that model. Okay? And let the model figure out how it should project the inputs in order to get away with fewer products at the end of the day. So to rein in the complexity that you get from taking all those pairwise products or providing the input. This is equivalent to taking a parameter tensor in your model and factorizing it. In various people like that, that Graham Taylor Maxim applied to various things. And it turns out it's much easier to train these models than uh, not with that factorization trick. <coughs> So a nice way to debug these models is to take random dot images and let them move around. Maybe shift them or rotate them or whatever you want to do to them. And then look at the filters uh, that the model chooses to project onto in order to model your transformations. So if you take images like these, there's nothing that you could possibly learn on any of them, but the relationships are very, very strong because it's not just translations. And then you see that the model does actually a full year basis to represent those translations. And you can look at both the input filters that you left image and the output filters in the right image and they turn out to be phase shifted for the components. Um, but you can plan on other kinds of transformation applications, right? And you're going to see something uh, that, is, that is a popular version of a Fourier transform if you want. Um, you can transform little parts of the image separately from other parts and you want to see filters that specialize and only look at certain parts of the image at a time. Um, you can also train a natural video, of course, and then you're going to see filters that uh, typically are localized before features which phase shift from one image to the other. Okay. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to interrupt me here in the talk. Yes? So they are topographic. Uh, your last example was topographic. Nicely organized. So, where's this coming from? Okay, so this comes from the way that we set up the cooling matrix. So, you might recall that there's a projection of the filters, the, filter gets, the filters get multiplied, and then there's a cooling matrix that gives you the hidden after that. And if you set up the cooling matrix to cool over neighboring kind of units at a time, then you can encourage the one to learn the subject of the um, Um, 
Um, it's very rich, though, because an orthogonal transformation of pixel space subsumes, for example, any computation matrix. So just jumbling the pixels from x to y in any kind of way is going to be included in that class. So it's, of course, shifts and rotations and things, and local translations and stuff. So the interesting thing about orthogonal transformations is that they decompose into a product of three matrices. So you can obviously compose it like that, where the matrix in the middle contains two by two blocks, which are just rotation matrices. And so what that says is that uh, one way to apply your orthogonal transformation is by just doing a matrix multiplication. The other is project onto those eigenspaces in which you have this almost diagonalization and uh, the rotation in those eigenspaces. So that's going to be one fact that we we'll use in a second. There's another one, which is if you take a class of transformations which commutes, and shift is an example of that, because if I shift your image, say, to the left and then up, you might as well shift it up and to the left. If you have a class of transformations that commutes like that, then it turns out that those transformation matrices in that class all have the same eigenspace. And that means that the space in which these rotations happen is always the same for all those elements in that class. So here's a little bit more intuitive way to see that. You take an input image x and you transform it to get an output image y. <coughs> What's going to happen under the hood is that you will just project into a, in, uh, the eigenspaces in which you perform some rotations and project back. And these eigenspaces are going to be the same for all transformations which happen to commute this one. <coughs> So the only thing that differs from one transformation to the other is the angle that you apply in those spaces. That's another way to explain why our factor model here with those multiplicative directions does the right thing. So it's a completely different angle to kind of, uh, end up with this model. Why is that? So what are we going to do? We project our input onto some filters, right? What I'm going to have to do now, if those filters were those eigenspaces, uh, would span those eigenspaces, then we know we have to compute the angles. We have to collect all those little angles to figure out which transformation I'm dealing with for this particular image band. So, um, so how do you compute an angle in some subspace where you just put the inner product between your two projections? But what is an inner product in a 2D space? It's nothing other than the sum of products of individual coordinates. And that's exactly what's happening in this kind of model of the things. So for technical reasons that I'm not going to go into, we typically want to pool not all, only over two units. You don't just want to compute those anchors, but you want to let the unit pool over many subspaces. Um, you can ask me later if you want to know why. Um, but that gives us back our bilinear factor bilinear model that we used to learn those filters like those shifted fully components, for example. And uh, it sort of explains why we get those components. So here's one reason why it's good to uh, look at this from the security factor. <coughs> An interesting property about those rotations is that the hidden unit is not going to care what the original angle in that subspace was of any of your two projections. It's only going to care whether they have a particular angle so if you present this to a hidden unit, it's going to give you the same response as if you, you present this to that hidden unit. Right? The original pose of the first image doesn't matter. All, the only thing that that hidden unit cares about is the relative angle of the projections. So there's a much simpler way to say that, which is um, when you encode a transformation, say, in the video, you're basically computing the derivative of the temporal evolution of that signal essentially over time. And the derivative doesn't depend on the actual value of the function. Um, so that means this encoding of transformations is automatically transformation invariant. So here's another way of thinking about this. You take an image and you shift it. And you present these two images to your hidden unit. It's going to fire up maybe because it's tuned for this particular shift. Uh, if I don't start here and don't present these two images, but I start over here and present these two images, that hidden unit is still going to fire exactly the same way. So the encoding of the transformation is naturally invariant to the pose of this component. 
So the reason that's interesting is that you can immediately turn that into a way to get invariant features. In fact, you don't even have to do anything. All this says is, if you want to get features that are invariant to some transformation, use videos for images. So use videos for training, so you have mapping units that are able to encode those angle, phase angle deltas. And then use videos for testing as well, because the encoding of those angle deltas is going to be naturally invariant to the both of these videos. But there's nothing you have to do to get invariance. You get it for free. All you have to do is train on video, let the model figure out what the transformations are, and at test time, show another video, and it's going to encode those transformations, and that's going to be an encoding of the object that's invariant to the, uh, the post. So you can test that on uh, <coughs> images that are rotated uh, in these digits. So if you train a model on video to predict rotated random dots, um, <coughs> and then you ask the model what are the classes here, and you, you use those transformations as features, put it in the classifier, and ask it to do classification. Or first of all, you can just ask it to show me the similarity between the digits. The model happily says that all the zeros here, which you see in this plot here, that's in the matrix, are similar to one another. But that might not be surprising because they are actually very similar to one another. But if you ask it about all the ones here, which have almost no pixel overlap at all, it still thinks they are basically the same thing. And this is just because it learns to ignore poles when it encodes that video. Uh, the same about all those tools and all those things. For comparison, you also see the image similarities in pixel space, which of course says that a pixel, an image, uh, sorry, a digit is very similar to itself, but it's a little different from the same as particular when there's no overlap in the opinion space. Um, and then you can use that for classification, and it's a very similar graph to sort of the same kind of data. Uh, the less data you have, the better you cash in on your invariants that you learn from those random dots. Um, <clears throat> but you do pretty well in, in general in cases. And the training data is not, uh, for learning those features, it's not digital. Right? The training data is random dots that are rotating around. That's what the one sees to learn as representation. <clears throat> so that's one potential application of encoding relations. In the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about two further fairly recent kind of uh, uh, experiments that we have been playing with. One is related to depth inference, and the other is related to analogy making. Um, so I'm going to start with steps. So here you see the two images again. And we train a model on uh, depth data that we synthetically generated, and we ask the model what is the structure you see in those images, and it says, well, I see a vessel bar here. Some of you who are able to do this trick of doing this on top of each other don't see this bar. <coughs> and then we thought, oh, maybe we should try that on uh, some actual depth data. Um, so here's data from the Kitty Challenge, which uh, contains all kinds of benchmarks, but it also contains depth images, stereo images, and associated depth maps. Um, we train on little patches from those images. And then the uh, first thing you can do is look at the filters that you see with the left and right camera. And what you typically see is that the model tries to encode something like a horizontal shift. And that's just because the model sees cameras that are sort of aligned well, they're next to each other, and so on. If the model hadn't seen cameras like that, so there's no calibration going on, right? So if you had rotated one of those cameras, the model would just rotate those filters to accommodate for that. So there's no such thing as calibration necessary for uh, <coughs> this type of model. Um, so incidentally, this is mainly worked by Kishore Honda, who is the student in Germany. Okay. Next thing you can do is uh, try to predict the depths from that encoding of the transformation. And uh, you can do something like just a regression or a linear regression or whatever uh, on those depths, on those transformation. <coughs> and uh, what you see is looks like this. So it's kind of not uh, fantastic. Uh, it, gets, it does a fairly decent job. It uh, sees that there's a descending street, uh, and there's a house on the side, and so on. Um, if you wanted to win depth inference 
which works in the, in the MRF on top and you know about things. Um, <coughs> I personally think this question is whether this means something that we want. Maybe it's sufficient to get just views of the world to allow us not to bump into things and deal with it back. Um, we can clean this depth map up a little bit by uh, asking the model to zero out values that it's not very certain about. Here's a task uh, which is fairly recent. Um, most of you know Hollywood 2. It's a benchmark data set for um, taking videos and telling you what is happening in that video. It's activity analysis. This is an extension of this kind of task where the video is actually 3D, so they're stereo. And um, the authors also give, uh, the generators of this data also uh, give you those depth maps to compute it. We decided to ignore the depth maps because we have few units that we want to encode the depth by themselves. And so there are various ways you can rate this now, right? You can set up your model to look across time, uh, to learn from motion. You can set up your model to look across those two cameras to learn about depths. And then you can kind of train modes and combine them on the top, or you can combine early on. And there are various variations of this, how to get depths and motion from the data. Um, we played with this a little bit, and maybe pitch more. And, um, here are some filters that uh, are typical. So you see that there's temporal structure of the model that codes by phase shifting across time, and then it has some phase shift that's almost the same across the space across those views. And you can put that in a standard pipeline, and um, then the usual thing happens. So if you compare to the, um, to the ground truth, which is basically uh, what the office of this event is provided uh, using handcrafted features, all kinds of 3D extensions of SIF and so on. Um, if you just use any kind of uh, deep learning method, uh, you boost the performance that you get from something like 12% to about 20%. So that's a good thing. So you know, you know, you know, be surprised about that. Um, <clears throat> and then if you compare across models um, that encode motion and depth, or motion and depth together, and combine them in various ways, you see that you you get a slight improvement uh, if you use depth structure explicitly or just using motion. But that improvement is not huge. Um, and that's exactly what those authors of this uh, that they use the have found using their handcrafted features. So depth helps a little bit. The coding of depths for which they use their pre-computed depth map, for which we use just our human responses of uh, the model of the cross cameras. But it helps a little bit. It does help on some classes and that's all. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a completely different task, which is analogy making, which interested me for a long time. It was one of the reasons why I got into relations in the first place. Um, all of you probably know what analogy making is. You're given two things, objects that are related in some way, and then you're asked to transfer that relationship that you see to another object. And that's trivial to do if you have a model that can encode relations. Why is it trivial? Well, all the model has to do is infer from the source pair the transformation and then apply it to another image or object. Um, I got very excited a few years ago and I started to, uh, to try this on toy data. So here what you see is a bar that's rotated and then you can ask the model to apply the transformation that you infer from this color here to all these images. Here, and then it happily says, okay, I think this is a rotation on 90, by 90 degrees to the left, and then it applies this to all digits, and it works nicely. And so I'm sort of proof that it infers the transformation correctly after training on random dots that rotate, and it can also transfer to something. <coughs> a bit later, we uh, played with uh, some more interesting new data, like faces. So, for example, you can do something like uh, show a face, like a face pair, like this and this. Model, and then ask it to apply the inferred transformation to some other faces that has never seen before. And um, even though this was trained on raw pixels, um, this is what we're going to do together with George Sussman. Um, it does apply the transformation that it sees very nicely to those examples, except for some cases where it doesn't work so well. Um, but what was most striking to us is that it basically keeps around the identity of the person despite changing the spatial expression quite strongly. Right? 
So you still see that this person here is the same across this uh, color, uh, even though it, I want to really render something new in there. And then we played with something like log data, uh, which is objects that the young students introduced, are shown from various angles, and you can ask the model to infer a transformation from, say, this pair of images, and then apply it to a new object that hasn't seen the training, and then it the object. So the way it does it is by decomposing, essentially, this really transformation, which is hard to deal with, into little Gabosi just that you the many, many little local transformations. So if you look at the filters that the model learns, it's basically very local less Gabosi features. Um, and it works well on some and not so well on others. So um, I said that I'm going to talk about some recent work. Um, <coughs> here's some recent work. Um, I'm going to wrap up with that. Um, this is work that um, was basically, basically done by Vincent Michalski, who is also a student. And he took this idea to do analogies one step further. And the idea is the following. We know that we have a model that can make analogies. Right? So why don't we train the model on analogies in the first place? So let's take two images and infer a transformation. And then rather than asking it to reconstruct this image and do a feature learning, let's ask it to reconstruct another image to which we apply the same transformation. And you can take that even further. You can say, OK, let's just take the video as a source of analogies. So let's take two frames in the video, infer the transformation, and then ask the model to apply the transformation again and again and again to the second image. And after 10 steps, you ask it to minimize the reconstruction cost. And now you can back up through time so that network can only turn down those parameters. Um, oops. There's a problem with that, of course, which is, and if you do this, then uh, you assume that the transformation you saw going from one frame to the other is going to be the same throughout the whole video. So you can model nothing other than the same transformation applied again and again. It doesn't, that doesn't really seem to make much sense uh, in any kind of practical data. But there's a very simple solution. You can add a layer and ask the model to infer the transformation from two images, then infer the transformation from the next two images. Now you have the motion code t minus 2, t minus 1, and another motion code t minus 1, t. And now you can just stack another layer on top that treats those transformations themselves as an input and tries to relate them. So you add another layer, and that's going to try to learn something about the relationships between those relationships themselves. Um, so in the sense that those bottom layer relations are something like the temporal derivative of the video, uh, the next layer is something like the second derivative. Right, it wanted something like acceleration. So in principle, of course, you could stack as many layers as you like. So far, we haven't gone any further than two layers. Um, and then again, you apply the, those transformations on the second layer to re-infer the transformation coming next. And then given that, you can re-infer the input. You can do that for 10 steps or 20 steps through time, and then back to the those parameters. Um, so here's some, some toy examples of that. So this is very uh, recent work, and uh, we have some so, um, you can try to train a model on rotations, for example, that change the rotation speed through time. And now what you have to do in order to fill in the future is infer the transformation from three seed frames. You need three seed frames because you need two transformations that gives you the acceleration. But you assume that sticks and you can predict forever into the future. And, um, the one take-home message for us was that uh, pre-training those models works well. It's actually necessary in most of the tasks that we get. But backdropping through time is also necessary in order to make the model actually work. And so what you see that here is it sees these two, three frames. It first the speed and acceleration. And then it predicts the future like this. And on top you see the ground truth of the accelerations involved in reality. And so that works very nicely. It also works nicely on shifts. And, uh, and so there are problems with that really back for some time. Um, a slightly more interesting task is this. So you take three views of uh, an object, and then for speed and acceleration, and then you ask the one to continue that rotation that it saw there. And uh, on mock data, it actually works much better than we were hoping for. 
Uh, this is test data that I never saw before, and it happily kind of renders images uh, even though the train is very small, it is a lot of things that Could be some more examples. I'm going to show you one more because I'm running out of time. Uh, here's an example that we model in first from these three, and it predicts the long into the future. And uh, if you look carefully, you're going to see that the model cheats a little bit by changing the identity of this element here, because it has never seen this kind of element before. But it's still at first that there's some four legged creature that you want to take from the future. Um, okay, we can try uh, this thing for the balls data, and it works very nicely. So to wrap up, I'm just going to show you um, a very recent experiment where we just tried to model <coughs> MIDI music uh, as a second order different equation. So you can just apply this to a piano roll representing MIDI music and see what happens um, when the model tries to predict music in the future. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, but it's beginning to uh, get a sense of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense in the general music. Um, so I hope that you can